bless the Lord. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive supernatural healing, deliverance, freedom, for it is your will that I be in health and that I prosper. I receive that today in the name of Jesus. And that's what I'll talk when I leave this place. I live in health and I prosper. Give him a good shout. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Shake hands with four or five people and tell them the Lord is good. And then you can be seated. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We welcome you here this morning. Any visitors that are here for the first time, would you hold up your hand? Any visitors? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Appreciate you coming. Trust you and enjoy the service today. Praise God. Amen. I'm not the pastor, but I'm the founding pastor. I'm one of the worst attending members here. Because <laughs> I'm going all over the world all the time, but I enjoy when I get to come home and be among my own company, praise God. And I know you're in good hands while I leave, praise God. And, and uh, we had a great service this morning with uh, Richard and Lindsay Roberts. Got to stand and give them a good hand, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. John Ben Dixon from South Africa has been with us for about a month now, you know, and he's eager to go home tomorrow. We keep trying to tell him that his wife doesn't miss him at all, and, uh, but he's ready to go home. So John, thank you for being here. You're such a blessing to us. He oversees all of our, our work over there. Praise God. Stand up, John. Give him a good hand. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. And we've got other special guests here, but if I start naming them all, I'll probably overlook somebody, and I, I don't want to do that. So all of the guests that are here, thank you for being here, and we love you, and believe that you're headed for the greatest days of your life. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, I've been looking forward to this morning. I have heard the word of the Lord. Praise God. Back in September, when we were having our Chariots of Light uh, POW rally, that's presidents and area leaders, and in one of the sessions one morning, I was just listening to Bill and Ginger talk and, and some others that were participating in that session, and I didn't have 2019 on my mind. I was just enjoying what we were doing at that present time. And suddenly I heard these words. He said, you've been asking me about 2019. What's on my agenda? And he said, well, here it is. I like the way he said it. Well, here it is. And so I got my pen out and started writing immediately. And here's what he said. 2019 will be a year of marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of your God. Marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of your God. Now, we're going to have that on the screen from this day throughout this year, praise God, so you can keep the vision before you. Marvels, say it with me, marvels, marvels. Wonders, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. God is into marvels. God is into wonders and God's into extraordinary manifestations of his greatness. That's the word I received. And I've been waiting for uh, the opportunity to be here with you because I always like to share that prophetic word with this congregation first. And then I take it to the world. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, you remember that throughout this year, our theme has been Show me your glory. Say that with me. Lord, show me your glory. 
I've preached that everywhere I've been, all over the world this year. And we've received great testimonies of people experiencing the three primary things that are involved in the glory of God. Number one, the manifested presence of God, the manifested power of God, and the manifested goodness of God. That's what the glory of God is all about. So say it with me, Lord, Lord continue to show me your glory. Now, I've encouraged people because this is the way the Lord said it to me. He said, you tell believers everywhere you go, keep these words on their lips and in their prayers every day. Lord, show me your glory. And, and, and I've been telling them, don't stop doing that just because 2018 is about to come to an end. Yeah. Keep doing it every day. Amen. Every day. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, every day. Every day. Because you and I need manifestations of his presence, his power, and his goodness, not just in one year, but every day of our lives. Amen. Amen. So I want to challenge you to just keep right on decreeing that right along with the prophetic word for 2019. And once again, that's marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. And we're going to get into that. Now, <clears throat> I plan to teach uh, between now and the end of the year at least three services on this. And then, of course, I'll continue talking about it when I'm back here from time to time. But I always like to get at least three messages uh, where they're recorded and we, we have them available to people uh, wherever we go so that they can catch up with the rest of us. So I'll be talking about this today. I'm going to lay the foundation and then uh, I'll be back a little later in November, I believe. And then I'll be back in December. Uh, so that'll cover three sessions where I'll be talking about this. And then I'll continue to do so uh, at other times in the future when I uh, have the opportunity to be here. Now, once again, the glory of God is the manifestation of God's presence, the manifestation of his power, and the manifestation of his goodness. And we base this on what we have seen in Exodus chapter 33 and Exodus chapter 34. Now, I want to go back to Exodus chapter 34, and you turn there with me, if you will, please. Exodus chapter 34. And in verse 10, God says these words. Behold, I make a covenant before all the people I will do marvels. Everybody say marvels. marvels. And that's part of the prophetic word for 2019. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the works of the Lord, for it is a terrible or it is a tremendous thing that I will do with thee. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's what he said to Moses and the children of Israel. But covenant is the key word here. Because only God can take back a covenant. Now, people can break it, but God will never break it. Amen? People break covenant, you know, uh, you know, the Native Americans that were here before all of us came. Well, I take that back. Before all of you came, <laughs> my ancestry is Native American. We were here first. And, uh, you know, they didn't really know much about lying, breaking covenant until the white man came. Don't throw rocks at me. <laughs> covenant breakers, you know, I mean, and it's happened down through history in this nation. You know, you take all the Native Americans and you push them off into a desert and, and think you're done with them. And then the nation gets in trouble financially and they discover gold on the reservations and they take back the land. That's breaking covenant. Yeah. That's right. And I think a lot of the problems we're having in our nation today is a result of all those covenants they broke in the earlier days. Amen. Amen. Just my personal opinion. You can agree or not, but it's not going to change my mind. 
But God never breaks covenant. Amen. Covenant is a solemn agreement. In fact, go to Hebrews chapter 6 and we'll come back to Exodus 34 in just a moment. Hebrews chapter 6. And here it talks about when he made covenant with Abraham. It says in verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham because he, would, he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee. Notice the word surely. Everybody say surely. surely. In the mind of God, this is a sure thing. Anybody like sure things? Yes. Surely blessing, I will bless thee and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Now you've all seen you know, courtroom dramas and, you know, and maybe you've even been in court where you had to give testimony. And one of the things they ask you when you take the stand is to lift your right hand and say these words. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. So what are you doing? Swearing by a greater. You're swearing by a greater. But here it says, because God couldn't turn to somebody greater than him, because he's the most high God. Yeah. There's no most or high. It's <laughs> most high is as high as it goes. Amen. Right. Amen. So he's the most high God. So he couldn't turn to anyone greater than him and swear. So the Bible says he swear by himself. So that means what God is saying, Abraham, if I ever break my word to you, then I forfeit everything I have because I swear by myself. In other words, I'm laying the entire corporate structure of heaven on the line. And God will never break covenant. Amen. So notice here, he says, uh, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. It's verse 17, and we're in God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. That word immutability means uh, unchangeable. It cannot be changed. And then it says, he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things. Now, what were these two immutable things? His oath and his promise. He took an oath and he made a promise. And when God takes an oath and he makes a promise, it's unchangeable. Can you say amen? Amen. I like that about God. Hallelujah. And so it says that by two immutable things <clears throat> to which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. So he's saying that you and I have something that is sure, it's steadfast, it's unchangeable, it can't be broken by God. And that's what gives us hope. Hallelujah. That's what gives me hope. I know that I know that if I ever find out what God has promised, then I know that I know that that promise will never change, not from God. Amen. Amen. That it's reliable, it's steadfast. And if I dare believe it and I refuse to let go of it, then it's just a matter of time. It will, not might, it will come to pass. Can you say amen? amen? And give the Lord a shout for that, praise God. Amen. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 34. And he says, I make a covenant before all the people. I will do marvels. I will do marvels. Now what is a marvel? that which arrests the attention and causes a person to stand or gaze or to pause with admiration and amazement. A marvel. That which arrests the attention and causes a person to stand or to gaze or to pause with admiration and amazement. Now, in the New Testament, I'll just give you a couple examples here. Matthew chapter 8, showing you that marvels didn't end with Moses because in the New Testament, Jesus did many things that caused people to marvel. 
Amen. If it caused people to marvel, then it was a marvel. <laughs> Somebody said, what's a wonder? Anything that makes you say, I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Amen. Now listen to this, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 through 27. There arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep, speaking of Jesus. And they awake him. And he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? That was a marvel. It caused them to stand in amazement. It caused them to, to stop and pause and think about what they had just seen. And the Bible says they marveled as a result of seeing his great power and his ability to just speak to the wind and speak to the waves. And there was a great calm. Can you say amen? amen? That's a marvel. Now, it says in, uh, oh, let's see, Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. It says, there was a man who was sick of the palsy. Jesus saith, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And he arose. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled. And notice what happens when people marvel over something God does. And they glorified God. Amen. Notice who got the glory out of all this. God. God's about to do some things in your life that are going to cause you to marvel. Amen. The, 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 the marvelous one has not ceased in his ability to cause men to marvel. Hallelujah. You know, I, I had things like that happen in the early days of my uh, my walk with the Lord, I mean, God did some unusual things that, that really took me back. I mean, uh, I'd, I'd seen things in the Bible where he did things that caused you to wonder how did that happen and marveled when it did happen. But when you experience them yourself, it marks you. Amen? It marks you. I remember uh, Carolyn and I, uh, when, when I first started, uh, when I, shortly after I'd surrendered my life to the Lord, I had an old car that was absolutely worn out, it had over a hundred thousand miles on it. And it was a, uh, uh, a Buick that I had, I mean, a Oldsmobile that I had bought wrecked, total wrecked. And I rebuilt it. Now you could not tell it ever been wrecked, but the engine and the transmission was shot. The guy had already worn it out before I got it. It was called a luxury sedan and luxury had left that car a long time ago. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and uh, so, uh, I mean, you had to believe God every time you got in that car. It, it did not respond to just turn the ignition on. It only responded to about 10 minutes in tongues first. <laughs> Amen. And we... Uh, when we came to work for Brother Copeland over here, we, that's the car we had. And uh, Brother Copeland asked me one morning to come and get him at his house and take him to the airport. Back then, there was a little airport out here called Oak Grove. And uh, it's now Spinks, where I keep my plane. And uh, it's a whole lot nicer and bigger than it was way back there in 1970, 71. And Brother Copeland wanted me to come and get him and take him to the airport. And he was going to fly somewhere. And it was a cold January day. Boy, it was cold. Well, I went out early that morning and prayed in tongues over that car to make sure it started. And it started. And then I drove it over to Brother Copeland's. Now, I had to go to his house and knock on the door and let him know I was there. But I didn't dare turn the engine off on that car because I didn't know if it'd start again, you know? So I just left it running. And so I went in and got Brother Copeland and brought his luggage out and all. He sat in the front seat next to me and I put it in drive and we took off. We're headed out to Old Grove. And uh, Brother Copeland said something to me and I could see his breath. It was so cold in my car, the heater didn't work. <laughs> Brother Copeland said, 
Turn the heater on, Jerry. I said, Brother Coleman, it's on full blast right now. He said, the heater's on? I said, yeah, don't be moved by what you feel. I'd learned that from him. And I finally got to use it on him, you know. And, uh, you know, he, he taught me, don't be moved by what you see. Don't be moved by what you feel. Don't be moved by what you hear. I said, Brother Coleman, it's on full blast. Don't be moved by what you feel. He's sitting there shaking. He got a top coat on. I just, I didn't have any clothes back then. I just had, you know, just something light. And, and I didn't even know what a top coat was. You know, I, I never owned a top coat. And so he's got this top coat on and he's got his gloves on and he's just sitting there shaking. And every time he'd say something to me, I could see his breath, you know. It's so cold in that car. And he sat there and he shook. And then finally he said, in the name of Jesus, I command this heater to work. Boy, that thing came on and it liked to run us out of there. It got so hot. I said, Brother Copeland, don't stop using your faith because the transmission slips and I don't know if it'll make it through that intersection and the traffic's coming your way. I said, don't you dare stop using your faith now. So we got all the way out to Oak Grove, you know, and got him on the airplane, and then I came back home. And that's the old car I was driving when I came to work for him. And, uh, and then, you know, how many of you remember retread tires? I couldn't afford, I couldn't afford new tires. And, and uh, I put some retreads on them, and the retreads come off. And... Uh, you know, and you could, you could hear them flapping when you're, you're driving down the road. You know, people see us now, they think they've never been through what we went through. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and so I needed some tires on that car. They can't drive around like that, you know, never knowing if it's going to come off. And uh, so I didn't have any money for new tires. So there was a guy who worked at Grace Temple who owned a service station. And I took my car to his service station. It was out here off of I-35 South. And uh, I, I knew him. I'd met him when I started going to church there. And I said, uh, do you have any retreads? He said, yeah, I have some retreads. I said, well, I need four on that car. He said, well, it looks like he's already got retreads on it. I said, yeah, but uh, we need some new retreads. These are, these are coming apart. And so uh, I said, uh, I, call me when you, you've got it ready. He said, no, you just come back this afternoon. I'll have it ready. So I came back to pick it up and there was brand new tires on it. it wasn't retread, brand new tires. And I said, uh, I believe his name is Mr. Pallard. I said, Mr. Pallard, I can't afford new tires. Ballard? Ballard. Ballard. Yeah. Ballard. Mr. Ballard, I can't, I can't afford new tires. I told you put retreads. He said, well, that's what I started doing. And he said, and somebody come by here and they happened to see your car on the rack. And they said, is that Jerry Savelle's old car? He said, yeah. He said, what are you doing to it? He said, well, he's putting some retreads on it. He said, I don't want that boy having retreads. Put some brand new tires on there. I'll pay for it. He said, and don't tell him who did it. And I knew it wasn't Brother Copeland because he was out of town. And, and I, I didn't know who did it. So when I came back to pick the car up, he told me that story. And when I walked, when I drove it away, I wondered who did that. I was never told. I wondered who did that. Now, I, I, got, a, I got a clue. I, I think Brother Colton's daddy did it. I'm not sure. But I always thought he did, but he never would tell me. But I wondered and I wondered for days. I wondered for weeks. In fact, sometimes I'd go out to get in that car and I'd, I'd wonder, who did that? Who did God use to do that? Well, you see, if it makes you wonder, it was a wonder. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? I, I got that all by myself. Hallelujah. Go ahead and touch me. Maybe some of this smarter run off on you. <laughs> Amen. And then we, we had that car for a while and we were going to Oklahoma 
to, to uh, was it my grandmother's funeral or something? We're going to Oklahoma. I think I was doing a youth meeting up there and we're in that car. And by this time, you know, we've already worn those tires out and we need more tires. And we're driving up there and uh, we stopped at a little, uh, uh, like a Sonic drive-in to get something to eat. And we didn't have any money. And so we, we bought two hamburgers and fries and Cokes and we split it among me and Carolyn and the two girls because I knew I had just enough money to get up there. And I didn't know, you know, you're doing a youth meeting. You don't know what they're going to give you coming back, you know. So I wanted to make sure I had enough money to get back home. So we, we just bought a meal and we split it between the four of us. But so we pulled off the highway to go to that, like a sonic drive-in. There was a, a Firestone truck. Let me take that. When we, got, when we got ready to get back on the highway, there was a Firestone truck past us. And it was loaded with new tires. And it, and it was going about 70 miles an hour. Well, I couldn't drive that fast in this car because I didn't know if it'd stay together. <laughs> you know? So we're, we're getting up on the interstate. And I look back to make sure there was no traffic coming. No traffic, because you don't know if this transmission will engage or not. So I looked back as far as Dallas, and there was nothing coming. <laughs> and I'm in Aldmore, Oklahoma, you know? And so there was nothing coming. And so then I pulled out on the highway. And so Carol and I and the girls were just driving north toward Oklahoma City. And I said, Carolyn, what is that coming down the highway? She said, well, it looks like two tires. And they were just rolling perfectly next to each other, rolling down the highway in our lane. And before they got to us, they, they went off and fall, fell off in the ditch. Well, I knew they must have fallen off that Firestone truck. So I stopped and sure enough, it was two brand new Firestone tires and I put them in the trunk and then there was no way I could catch that truck. So I thought, well, when I get to Oklahoma City, I'll call the Firestone store and let them know that they, they lost some tires. Now, there were three or four Firestone stores in Oklahoma City. I called every one of them. They said, no, nobody's reported we've lost any tires. And uh, I said, I know they came off that truck. He, and finally, the last guy said, well, sir, all I can tell you, they're yours now. Take them. Nobody's reported any tires missing. So I went back and looked in the trunk because I didn't look what size they were. And I looked in the trunk and they were perfectly my size. Hallelujah. <laughs> now I wondered how that happened. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost not going to say this because I know what's coming from Richard. <laughs> I believe an angel thumped them off that truck. <laughs> angels coming up, angels coming down. Hallelujah. I believe an angel just thumped two tires off that truck. The Bible says you might entertain angels unaware. That's right. Come on. Yes, sir. Well, how could God do that? I wonder how God could do that. Well, now you've just experienced a wonder. Yeah. <laughs> and those tires fit perfectly on my car. Come on. Amen. Well, we started believing God for a better car. And uh, so a gentleman had this. 1969 Pontiac Bonneville, and it was low mileage, practically brand new. This was about 1971, something like that. And uh, he, he offered to sell it to me for below market price. And I thought, praise God, this has got to be God. So I, I told him, yes, sir, we'll take it. And uh, I didn't have a dime. And he said, uh, well, what do you believe in? I said, I believe God's going to get me that car. He said, all right, I set myself in agreement with you. And so some time went by and uh, he called me. And he said, have you got the money yet? I said, according to Mark eleven twenty four, 24, I believe I received. He said, well, I'm standing in faith with you. But, you know, time went on. Time went on. I mean, several months went by. And finally he called and he said, have you got the money for that car yet? I said, I'm standing on Mark 11:24. 24. 
He said, well, uh, I'm sorry to tell you, I need to sell the car. He said, I was, I was hoping that, that God would come through and, and make it happen for you, but I've got to sell this car. And so when he hung up, oh, my, my spirit just fell. You know, it was just, I thought, man, I, I, did I miss God here? I, I was feeling that thing called discouragement come on me. And then I said, Lord, what about this? And he said, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. I said, Lord, did you hear the conversation? <laughs> the man's selling the car. He said, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. Don't let that man expect to receive anything from God. I said, Lord, you don't understand how we do things down here. <laughs> <laughs> the man is selling the car. So I can't keep believing for it when he's selling it. He said, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. Don't let that man expect to receive anything from God. I said, are you telling me you want me to continue to believe for it even though the man is selling it? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I said, Carolyn, the man is selling his car, selling the car, but God told me a double-minded man is unstable and he can't expect to receive anything from God, so I'm still believing that's my car. And later that day, that man called me and said, Jerry, I owe you an apology. I said, why? He said, man, when I hung up the phone after talking to you, God got all over me. He said, you know that's Jerry Savelle's car and you better do everything you can do to get in your power to see to it he gets it. He got all over him. He said, that's your car. I said, it is my car. And I told him what the Lord said to me. And he said, uh, well, come on over here and get it. I said, no, I, I'm going to pay cash for it. He said, I know it's yours. God knows it's yours. Dear God, everybody knows it's yours. You know, <laughs> come get it. I said, no, sir, I'm not going to take possession of it physically until I have the money to pay cash for it. And we were getting ready to go on a trip to Arkansas to preach. And I'm in this old car that I have. And uh, I was determined that if that's how we had to go, then we just believe God for that thing to make it and believe God for it to come back. And the man said, aren't you going on a trip? And I said, yes, sir. He said, in that car of yours? I said, yes, sir. He said, no, I wouldn't be able to sleep all night if I knew you was out on the highway with your family in that car. Come get the car. I know it's yours. Everybody knows it's yours. He said, come get it. So I said, okay, I'll drive it on this meeting and then I get home, I'll, I'll bring it back to you. He said, well, you do whatever you want to do, but come get the car. So we got the car. And boy, we're sitting in this nice 1969 Pontiac Bonneville. As we say in the South, we felt like we were in high cotton, <laughs> you know, and we're driving it to Arkansas. And boy, did we have a meeting in Arkansas. We fought every demon in the state of Arkansas while we was there. And we were coming home and I'm taking it back to his house. And he said, uh, do you enjoy the car? I said, oh yeah, it's a nice car. He said, uh, boy, you like it, huh? And I said, yes, sir, I really like that car. He said, well, it's yours. And I said, yeah, I know it's mine. He said, no, I, I'm telling you, it's yours. I said, yes, sir, I know it's mine. He said, no, you're not listening. It's yours. And finally, I realized he's saying something that I'm not really catching. He said, somebody came in here and asked about that car. And he said, I told him that Jerry Savelle's in it and that car belongs to him. And he said, uh, they said, has he already bought it? And he said, well, he's believing God for the money to pay cash for it. He said, how much you want for it? And he gave me cash. It's your car. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. I don't know who did that either. I still don't know to this day who did that. I got a suspicion, <laughs> but I don't know for sure. So that created a wonder. Yes. Come on. A wonder. So good. Amen. God is into doing wonders. Makes you, makes you pause and think and ask the question. I wonder how that happened. I wonder who did that. Amen. You know, I, I do that myself now quite often 
where I do things for people and I tell the, the person that's involved in it or the, 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 the one that's making it, you know, the transaction, I'll tell them, don't tell them where it came from. Just make them wonder. <laughs> Amen. I bless a lot of people where, where they don't have any clue that it came from me. One time I said to Brother Copeland, uh, I said, Brother Copeland, now I'm asking you to set yourself in agreement with me for something. I said, but I'm not asking you to do anything about it. In fact, I'd prefer that you not do anything about it. He said, well, why not? I said, well, if you did it, it'd be difficult for me to tell the testimony because people know our relationship. And they'd say, well, yeah, if I had a friend like Kenneth Copeland, oh, come on. you know, it'd happen to me. So I'd, I'd just rather you not do it. He said, well, what if God tells me? <laughs> I said, well, I guess that'd be okay. But, but I'd, and I said to him, I would prefer that it come from someone else than you. Because I don't want people to think, well, all this good stuff happens to Jerry, Sell, Jerry Savelle. Couldn't even remember the name there for a moment. <laughs> Jerry Savelle. <laughs> because of this relationship he has with Kenneth Copeland. Amen? Because that, that'd be easy. You know, it's like Brother Copeland said, when, when they found gas out on his property, he was believing for that before they ever found it. And he said, if I came in and told you we did this and we did that and, and you knew we had gas wells, you'd just say, well, yeah, if I had gas wells, we could do this and we could do that. But we started doing it before the gas wells ever came. Right. See, in other words, so you don't, you don't have something in the natural to look to yeah. and say, well, that's why that happened. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. God wants to do things in our lives that make us wonder, how did that happen? Where did that come from? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm ready for it, praise God. Now notice here he says, I will do marvels. I will do marvels. Here's another story in Matthew chapter nine, verse 32 and through 36. They brought unto him a man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the multitude marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. Now, you remember what we saw in Exodus 34? He said, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to do some things that's never been done before. I'm going to do some things that people have never seen before. And remember, this is covenant. This is covenant. Do you think we've seen all that God can do? I haven't. If you have, I'll sit down and you finish the sermon. I haven't seen everything God can do. I haven't heard er about everything that God can do. And I don't think anybody on this planet has yet because there's still so much more that God has in store. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither heart has conceived all the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Well, I'm one who loves him. Anybody else in here love him? Yes. Well, then there's things that your eyes haven't seen yet. Your ears haven't even heard about yet. And your heart has not even conceived yet. Amen. Hallelujah but God's already prepared them and he's about to release them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. Now, once again, I will make a covenant before all the people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. All the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it's a tremendous thing that I will do with thee. The message translation says, I will work wonders that have never been created in the earth. Now the Amplified implies that these things that God will do will cause those who observe them to be full of awe. And the word awe means, let me turn to it. 
an overwhelming feeling of admiration and reverence. An overwhelming feeling of admiration and reverence. And notice that God said this is covenant to him. So once again, a covenant is a solemn agreement. And here's how God feels about covenants. Psalm 89, 34. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. He goes on to say in verse 35, and once I have sworn, I will not lie. So I ask you, how reliable is a covenant that God makes? Can we truly expect him to back it? Well, of course, Isaiah 55, 11 says, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereinto I've sent it. The message translation says, the words that come out of my mouth, they'll complete the assignment that I gave them. Every promise has an assignment and that promise is fulfill, be fulfilled. Amen. For those that will dare believe it and those that will hold fast to it, then God's assignment on that promise is come to pass in that person's life. Can you say amen? amen? Is that evidence enough that we can depend upon him when he gives us his word, when he makes covenant? God doesn't break covenant. People do, but God doesn't. Now, just for example of what happened after he said these words to Moses. When God made this covenant with Moses, the children of Israel saw marvels. They saw wonders. They saw extraordinary manifestations of God's greatness in their passing through the wilderness, in their entrance into Canaan's land, uh, God smiting the rock at Kadesh where the waters flowed abundantly and through the healings that took place when they had been bitten by the fiery serpents and through the dividing of the waters of Jordan, uh, the walls of Jericho coming down, falling flat, the sun and the moon standing still for them until God had avenged them of their enemies. Wouldn't you call that marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of God? Amen. They saw things they'd never witnessed before, and it was obvious that it was the Lord's doing and not man's. Amen. Hundreds of years later, the prophet Joel says this in Joel chapter 2 and verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. The Lord will do great things. And one of the meanings of the phrase great things is beyond the usual. God will do things beyond the usual. In other words, God's about to do some things in our lives that will be unusual. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Don't limit God to what you've already seen. Don't put him in a box that he can only do it this way or that way. God is not God in the box. Get him out of the box. Because he's unlimited. Yes. Amen. Amen. And don't be telling him how to do it. <laughs> That's right. Come on. Don't become a Naaman. When, when Naaman went to the prophet to get cleansed of the leprosy and the prophet wouldn't even come out to see him, wouldn't even talk to him, sent his servant and told him, go jump in the river. He got mad. And he, he wasn't willing to do what the prophet told the servant to tell him. He wanted the prophet to come out. He'd already made up his mind. This is how it's going to happen. You're not telling God how it's going to happen. Amen. God's been doing this before you were ever born. Can you say amen? The greatest revelation you'll ever receive is God is smarter than thee. He's got ways you couldn't think of in a million years. And what did Naaman say? I thought surely. Well, that's the big mistake that most Christians make. They thought surely it's going to happen this way or it's going to happen that way. No, let God be God. Amen. God doesn't need your help. Just trust him. Amen. Like the person that Brother Copeland said one time, they asked him to, you know, pray over their finances. They did a great financial miracle. And he said, 
uh, after he prayed, he said, now just trust God. And they said, well, where's he going to get it? And Brother Colton just simply said, he'll come by it honest. Just trust him. <laughs> Amen. Just trust him. Look at your neighbor and say, just trust him. Amen. If you could have already made it happen, you would have already made it happen. So you don't have any choice. Trust God. Amen. And say, God, I'm open for surprises. Hallelujah. Amen. So one of the meanings of great things is beyond the usual, beyond the usual. And once again, God says through the prophet Joel, and I will show wonders in the sky. Notice he's always, even from the days of Moses, right up to the book of Joel, he's still talking about doing wonders. So wonders have not ceased. Can you say amen? amen? Now, a wonder here in the book of Joel refers or implies something unfamiliar or inexplicable that is unable to be explained other than it had to be something God did. Did my mic go off? I'm getting no response. I'll say it again. Wonders here in the book of Joel, I will show wonders. Something unfamiliar, inexplicable, that is unable to be explained other than it had to be something that God did. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, there's things that's happened in my life. I can't explain it. But I know God did it. I know God was behind it. Yes. Amen. Amen. God was behind it. Yes. We were, uh, I was preaching up in Baltimore a couple of years ago. And I got back to the room. And I had flown up there commercial because at the time I didn't, I didn't have an airplane in the ministry. I'd sewn it into another ministry. And I really thought after I sewed it, maybe... I'm done with aviation. Maybe I don't need airplanes anymore. And uh, so I wasn't really believing for my next airplane like I always had previously. And so I'm, I'm hanging my suit up and I knew I had a, an early flight the next morning so I packed away everything I didn't need. And the Lord said, at what time did I tell you that you can fulfill what you're called to do without airplanes? I said, you didn't. He said, didn't I tell you that back in 1969 when you first surrendered your life to me that you wouldn't be able to fulfill what I've called you to do without airplanes in your ministry? And I told you, I don't want you ever paying or, or borrowing money for airplanes. I want you to believe for them paid cash. I said, yes, sir. He said, then whose decision was it to not believe for your next airplane? I said, apparently it was my decision. He said, then let me ask you this. Are you done? Are you through? I said, no, sir, I'm not through. He said, well, then how can you fulfill what I've called you to do if you're not through without airplanes now? I said, apparently I can't. I stand corrected. I said, consider me back on my faith for my next airplane. Now, little did I know behind the scenes in another nation, in the nation of Australia. Little did I know, God was already working behind the scenes. And one of my partners and board of directors in our ministry in the nation of Australia, he sold a business and he sent the tithe from that sale of that business to our ministry here in the U.S., and it came to the sum of $500,000, a half a million dollar tithe. And he said, it's for your airplane. So when I got home, I told Carolyn that I'm back on my faith for my next airplane. She said, well, I knew that wouldn't last long, you know. <laughs> and so uh, I said, I'm back on my faith for my next airplane. And then I found out that this man had sent half a million dollars to go toward the next airplane. Now he'd never told me, he'd never heard me say anything about I'm done with aviation. I, no, he hadn't heard anything. He just heard God say, send him half a million dollars. So it wasn't long after that 
I got a call from Keith and Phyllis Moore. And Brother Keith said, uh, Brother Jerry, when you were here at my church last time, we were in the back, you know, uh, in the speaker's room, and we were talking airplanes, and you said that you didn't think that you were going to be involved in airplanes anymore. He said, are you sure? I said, well, I told him what happened in Baltimore. I said, well, Keith, I, I got corrected. And I said, so I back on my faith for my next airplane. He said, well, I didn't think that was God when you said it, but you know, I, I, I didn't want to, you know, rebuke an elder, you know? And he said, so uh, I just wanted to tell you that, that we're believing for our next airplane and God told me to give you the one I'm flying now. I said, that's God. <laughs> Amen. And uh, so he, he flew it down and we took possession of it, you know, and he said, no, you know, it's a good airplane. And I've flown in that airplane before. It's a good airplane. But he said, it's coming up where it's going to start needing some, you know, new avionics and so forth and, and all that. And he said, and, uh, uh, but you, you probably got at least another couple of hundred hours before you have to fool with all that. He said, but uh, uh, I want you to have it. I'm sowing it into your ministry. So we got the airplane and then I sent it out to see what the new avionics, state-of-the-art avionics would cost. Uh, $500,000. Come on, that's right. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> I got the money for the upgrades before he even got the airplane. God was working behind the scenes. And oh, it's a sweet airplane. My, 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 is it a sweet airplane? It's the fastest one I've ever owned. We fly at 42,000 feet all over the country. Uh, sometimes we're doing over 600 miles an hour and we're waving at the commercial airlines as we fly over them. Hallelujah. Amen. That's God. That's God. That's a wonder. Amen. Amen. God is still into wonders. Amen. Don't limit God. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, don't limit, God. don't limit God. He's not through with you, praise God. And he's not through doing the miraculous. Amen. The psalmist once said, Psalm 77, 14, thou art the God that doeth wonders. Amen. It didn't say thou art the God who used to do wonders. Thou art the God who doeth wonders. If he was ever into wonders, he's still into wonders. Can you say amen? amen. And Psalm 96, verses three and four. Declare his wonders among the people, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. And Psalm 136, verses three and four. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords. To him alone doeth great wonders. Amen. Amen. Then when you get over into the New Testament on the day of Pentecost, after the 120 were filled with the Holy Ghost, Peter stands up and uh, says these words, Acts 2, 30, uh, Acts 2, 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Then he started quoting the prophecies of Joel and he not only talked about uh, the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit taking place, but he also included what Joel said, and I will show wonders. Yeah. So apparently wonders didn't end with Moses. Wonders didn't end with Joel. They didn't end on the day of Pentecost. Our God is the God of wonders. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. God is still keeping that covenant where he will show wonders. Now look at this, Acts chapter five, verse 12. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. It goes on to explain them. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And they were healed. Amen. That's a marvel. That's a wonder. That's, that's extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of God. Amen. 
the shadow. They just, they just got under Peter's shadow. And the shadow was anointed. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I was walking through a mall in Southern California. And Carolyn and the girls, we were all out there and they wanted to go to the mall. And, and so they were going to go shopping. I said, I, I'm just going, I'm just going to stand here and just kind of window shop. You guys go do whatever you want to do and we'll meet for lunch somewhere. So I'm just walking down the quarter of this mall and I'd see something in a window and I'd walk over here and I'd look a little bit and then I'd look back over here and I'd walk over there and look in that window and I'm just zigzagging down through that mall. And all of a sudden, somebody came running behind me and laid their hand right on my shoulder like this and whirled me around and said, I knew it was you. I knew it was you. I said, it's me. <laughs> and the lady said, I have been sick and the doctors are telling me they didn't know what was wrong with me, but I was laying in bed this morning and God said, get up and follow the light and you'll receive your healing. And she said, where do I go? And he told her that mall. And so she stood at the end of the mall and she said, I saw a light go here and I saw a light go over here. And then the light went over here and the light went over there. I saw light. I didn't see a person. I saw light. And she said, and I took off running and I knew when I touched the light, I'd be healed. And she whirled me around and God healed her instantly. Praise God. Amen. You remember that, Carolyn? Ah, my, my, my. Hallelujah. Now, I can't say that every time I go to the mall that happens. But it has happened. Amen. It has happened. The sh very shadow of Peter. Wouldn't that be considered, because I haven't seen that anywhere else in the Bible. Exodus 34, I'll do things the world has not seen. Don't limit God just because you haven't seen him do it that way. Hallelujah. What do you suppose for the lack of a better phrase, but you'll understand. What do you suppose he's cooking up right now for you? Look, you never say, he's cooking up something marvelous. I know that. Why? Because he's the God of wonders. Say it with me. He's the God of wonders. Hallelujah. Do you remember the definition I gave for great things? That which is beyond the usual. And the definition that I gave you for wonders, something unfamiliar, that which is unexplainable, except that you can only explain it by saying it was something God did. Well, here's another example of that. People being healed just by getting under the shadow of Peter. I wrote in my notes, get rid of words like that's impossible. I've never heard of anything like that. There's no way, and I can't believe that. Shut that up. Get rid of that. Get rid of those phrases. Amen? Get rid of those phrases. Because the wonder worker wants to do things that you have never seen before. You've never even heard him do things like that before. But don't limit him. If anybody else is going to limit him, let it be the unbeliever, but not you. You're a believer. Say, I'm a believer. I believe in the wonder worker. Hallelujah. This is my time for marvels, wonders, extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of my God. Say, my God. And give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. The book of Acts goes on to say in Acts 6, verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did wonders and miracles among the people. The apostle Paul, speaking of the things that happened in his own ministry, Romans 15, verse 19, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. Mighty signs and wonders. So does this sound like that God stopped doing marvels, wonders, and extraordinary things with Moses and the children of Israel? No, it doesn't. Hallelujah. Amen. And you have to remember once again the key word, this is covenant. Yes. Psalm 105, verse 7 and 8, the message translation says, 
He's God, our God, in charge of the whole world. And he remembers his covenant for a thousand generations. He's as good as his word. Hallelujah. The Amplified Bible says, he is earnestly mindful of his covenant and forever it is imprinted on his heart. Glory to God. For him to no longer do marvels and wonders and extraordinary manifestations, he'd have to break his own word. And that word is imprinted on his heart. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? Tell somebody, I'm headed for marvels and wonders. The best is yet to come. Now you've heard me talk about this verse, but I can't close this without repeating it. Job chapter five, verse nine. Job said, God doth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. And the message translation says, after all, he's famous for great and unexpected acts and there's no end to his surprises. There's no end to his surprises. Hallelujah. And I might add that another meaning for wonder is that which produces or creates a sense of surprise. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 2, one of the blessings. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. And the word overtake in the little Hebrew, one of the meanings is take by surprise. Hallelujah. All these blessings will come on thee and overtake thee, take you by surprise. That happens to me all the time. Amen. Uh, just during the minister's conference. Now folks, if you ask my wife, she would tell you, I don't need another motorcycle. I give motorcycles away and they come back to me in fleets. So I don't really need another motorcycle. But somebody dropped a note in my bag. Tony, did they give it to you? Did you put it in the bag? I wonder who put that in that bag. Anyway, <laughs> and I got home and opened the note and, and uh, here's another motorcycle being given to me. <laughs> but do you think God's counting? <laughs> that boy's got enough motorcycle. Carolyn's counting, but not God. <laughs> How many motorcycles can a boy have? I don't know. But I aim to find out. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I've given motorcycles away. I've given them away. And it's not something that, you know, I'm just materialistically minded. I walked in my shop and said, God, I just want to show you that you're still number one and I'm giving all this away just to show you that the only thing these things mean to me is the fact that you blessed me with them. But you're still number one. Amen. And then I have to build a bigger garage. <laughs> you can't outgive God. And you know what I did? When I read that letter and him giving me that motorcycle, I, it come up in my spirit right then because I'm the one who gave him that motorcycle. He said, son, you know who that motorcycle belongs to. I said, yes, it's his. He said, well, he's believing for something in return and that's the best seed he has. He said, receive it and then sow it back to him and then you, when I told Carolyn about it, she and I decided we were going to be the, the source, well, God's the source, but he was going to use us to meet the need that he was sowing that bike for. Wow. And I got to call him last night and then we were all sitting there listening on the phone and oh, you should have heard the joy. Oh, he was so excited. He was in his car going down the road. He started crying. He said, I got to pull over. I got to pull over. I, gotta, I, I can't drive anymore. And he was shouting and praising God. Yeah. And I kept hearing the Lord say, surprise, <laughs> surprise. 
He said, I can't wait to get home to my wife and tell her. Oh, it was a great surprise. Hallelujah. So notice here, blessings will come on thee and take you by surprise. Amen. Amen. Moses said next to chapter 15, verse 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? And the message translation says, who compares with you, wonder working God? No one compares to our wonder working God. And Malachi 3.6 says, God speaking, I am the Lord, I change not. Well, if he was a wonder worker yes. in Moses' day, yes. and he was the wonder worker yeah. in the prophet Elijah's day, and he was the wonder worker in Joel's day, and he was the wonder worker in Peter's day, and Paul's day, and Stephen's day, yeah. he's still the wonder worker today because he changes not. Can you give him a good shout? Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I guess I better take up the rest in part two. But let me close it with this. Hebrews chapter four and verse two. I'm not nearly through, so we'll just take it up here next time. Hebrews chapter four and verse two. This is very important. Not that the rest hasn't been important, but this is, this is what makes it all happen for you. Verse two. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So notice there were people who heard the things that God had to say, but the people, some of them didn't mix faith with it. And the word says, and therefore it did not profit them. Now I pray that that will not be the case with anybody in this auditorium. But it's quite possible it could be that there'll be people that will be testifying all year long of wonders and marvels and extraordinary manifestation. And other people say, well, that's not happening to me. Well, here's your answer. Did you mix faith with it? I said, did you mix faith with it? How's, how's, how's the first way that you mix faith? You simply say, I receive this. I receive that. Say right now, I receive by faith the prophetic word that Brother Jerry just gave me this morning. I receive it. I mix my faith with it. And it will profit me. And give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, stand up. And let's thank God once again for the great things that are in store for those that love God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you this morning. And Lord, I'm impressed to pray over, over people in particular who have their own businesses. And I'm praying in Jesus' name that this will be their time to excel in whatever it is that you've called them to do in the way of this business. I'm asking you, Heavenly Father, that there will be transactions take place over the next few months that will take them to the next level in their business. Some of whom will even have to build bigger buildings or find more space. In the name of Jesus, more clients, more God ideas so that great prosperity will come to them for the purpose of not only being able to take care of their families well, but for the purpose of blessing the kingdom of God and blessing those that are in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Enable them to become greater givers, greater sowers, greater tithers, greater blessings to humanity in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I don't pray that only for those who have business, 
But in particular, because I sensed it in my heart, that there are businesses that over the next few months are going to grow and expand and increase and multiply in the name of Jesus. Some of whom will go beyond the borders of this city that will begin to reach out statewide, some on a national level, and some even an international level in the name of Jesus. Why? Because you're the God of wonders. And how will it happen? Well, we wonder. But we trust you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I want, I want reports to those when they come in. I want reports of that when they come in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. And Lord, the last thing I want to pray over them, because it's something so dear and special to me, is increased favor. Increased favor on their lives. Lord, more and more surprises in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it. Let's lift our hands and bless the Lord one more time. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on.